Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me so much pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of India Habitat Center and Professor Binoy K. Behan. Today's talk is the 28th in his monthly series, Glimpses of Culture. How does one speak of an art historian who is a respected speaker at a breathtakingly long list of prestigious universities and museums around the world? Yet, art history is only one part of his life's mission. He is a filmmaker who has made over 146 deeply researched documentary films. He is an eminent photographer, Buddha scholar, and a record setting traveler. He is the author of some of the best selling books on Indian art history in the world. As a labor of love, Professor Behan has traveled to all corners of this vast subcontinent, documenting even remote temples and sites, not just once, but several times. The result is a breathtaking documentation of culture, which provides a new perspective to Indian and Asian art and culture. Today, Professor Behel takes us back to the beginnings of Indian art at the sites of the Indus Valley Civilization. In subsequent months, he will trace for us the development of Indian art over the centuries. Ladies and gentlemen, Benoy K. Behel speaks to us today on roots of an ancient art. Thank you for your attention and over to Professor Behel now. Thank you very much, Sujata Chatterjee. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Such a pleasure to be with all of you. We, well, we live today in a very commercialized world, a very materialistic world. This modern world that we live in is so full of uh, the chase of material objects and uh, uh, there is so much of this noise and clamor of the material world about us all the time. In the middle of all this, it is such a joy to come across a document which says, art is very valuable. It is more precious than gold or jewels. And that document is the Chitra Sutra, the oldest known treatise on art making. Now, we will take a look today at the roots which provide the sustenance, which, which create this art, which create this attitude towards art, which creates this attitude towards life, where art is the most important treasure of humankind. This attitude in which, despite all our chasing of the material world around us, we're informed clearly that what is more important is art. So we will take a look at uh, the roots of this. And the roots of it are to be found right since the time of what is called the Indus Valley Civilization, 5,000 years ago. It is remarkable to see that uh, while other civilizations of that period, like uh, the civilization of Mesopotamia, uh, Egypt, and others, and also later civilizations, all had art which showed uh, war uh, victories, which showed war uh, memorials, which uh, depicted the glory of uh, war. The art of the Indus Valley does not have a single depiction of anything related to warfare. Archaeologists have also discovered that uh, there are no weapons of war 
to be found at the Indus Valley civilizations. There may be a single blade which is found somewhere, but uh, single or a couple of blades are not weapons of war. Weapons of war are found in their hundreds or their thousands where they are found. So this is a very remarkable case that archaeologists have not been able to find the weapons of war like they are found in all other cultures. In fact, what is equally remarkable is that uh, barracks have not been found. Now, barracks, the archaeologists uh, would say, are essential for the keeping of army or police. And they have not been found. So even if we do not try to see this as conclusive evidence of the fact that the Indus Valley civilization was so peaceful in its attitude that it had no army or police, which does seem to be a distinct possibility. But even if we say that this is not the final and conclusive evidence of that, even then, what a marvelous idea, what a marvelous vision of a society which lived like this. Indeed, this is something which we need to know much more about. And here we find uh, the deep roots of an art which continued. Now, what else does the Chitra Sutra say? The Chitra Sutra says that uh, human beings, individuals, ephemeral personalities which come and go are not important enough to be the subject of art. Art is more important. It is reserved for the eternal themes. Now, in later times, as as we find uh, uh, through, as you will, as I will share with you through the course of these uh, many lectures to follow, which will trace the development of uh, Indian art. Uh, indeed, for 1500 years, there, was, there were no portraits made in Indian art. While they were uh, the making of uh, beautiful images of deities, of animals, of birds, of uh, composite creatures, yet the ephemeral personalities, the people who walk upon the stage of life for a day or two and then are gone, were not given the importance of art. And indeed, when we look at uh, the Indus Valley civilization, we find that right from here itself, uh, there is uh, all the art is of uh, a very uh, very personalized kind of a small scale. There is no grand or glorious art. So these are the roots which will uh, develop and will lead to the marvelous uh, giant uh, trees which blossom and provide us the fruits and the flowers of Indian culture in times to come. And my many thanks to India Habitat Center for yet one more opportunity to share another chapter of the art and culture of India with all of you. My many thanks to Doordarshan for uh, in a world of uh, TRPs for, uh, for television channels. It's been uh, quite remarkable that uh, over the years, they have consistently uh, patronized the making of my films on deeply researched subjects, serious subjects, not entertainment subjects. I'm very grateful to them. So I will now request uh, Sushant to please uh, run the film, and I hope you enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, I will come on again after the film to share more thoughts with you. Thank you very much.
The Early Art of India is a valuable record of the thoughts and the vision of one of the most ancient civilizations in the world. This ancient art brings before us a view of the world which sees a great harmony in the whole of creation. It sees the same which is in each of us, in the animals, the flowers, the trees, the leaves, and even the breeze which moves the leaves. All that there is, is seen to be a reflection of the one. The phenomenal world of separated beings and objects seen around us is an illusion perceived and brought to us by our senses. Absorbed in this, we are blinded to the reality beyond. The primary illusion is the perception of ourselves as individual entities, which leads us on a path of egoic existence. The high purpose in life is to seek reintegration with the One to perceive ourselves as part of the beauty of the Divine. Our experience of beauty when we respond to a sunrise or to a great work of art is seen to be a moment when we perceive the grace which underlies the whole of creation. The moment of the aesthetic experience is stated in Indian thought to be akin to Brahmananda or the final ecstasy of salvation itself. The Chitra Sutra of the Vishnu Dharmotra Puran, which was penned out of earlier oral traditions in the 5th century AD, is perhaps the oldest known treatise on art in the world. It states that art is the greatest treasure of mankind, far more valuable than gold or jewels. There are no gods in the early philosophic vision of India. There are deities. Deities who are the personifications of concepts and qualities qualities are within us. When we respond to these deities brought to us in art, we awaken those fine aspects within us. When we are filled by that grace, there is no space left for base desires and pain. We have become that deity. For about a thousand years in early times, vast quantities of art were produced in India. Deities, mythical creatures, animals, plants, trees, forms in which these beings were combined were made, as also common men and women. Yet, this art did not depict the kings who patronized the art nor was the name of the artist mentioned. According to the ancient treatise on art making, the Chitra Sutra, personalities are too unimportant to be depicted in art. The purpose of art is a noble one, to show the eternal beyond the ephemeral. Images from material life are very often seen in Indian art. The achievement of knowledge is likened to a victory. We see images of deities trampling the demons of ignorance. However, the demons smile as they are vanquished. In this world where all is seen as a part of a cosmic harmony, there is no anguish finally.
What survives today of the early art of India is only a small fraction of what would have been created. Yet, it consists of such vast numbers of monuments and sculpture that it staggers the mind. In the fourth millennium BC, one of the earliest civilizations of the world was developing in the river valleys of the Indian subcontinent. The first sites of this civilization were discovered at Mohenjo-daro and Harappa in the basin of the Indus River. The name Indus Valley Civilization has remained. However, hundreds of other sites have been found in recent decades in Gujarat, Maharashtra and eastwards to Uttar Pradesh. It was by far the largest area of any civilization in the world at that time. There was a sophisticated concept of town planning. But there were certainly skilled, uh, well-trained engineers. And you see this when you just look at the towns, the way the towns are laid out, very systematic, with broad avenues for major traffics between the gates, for example, and then smaller roads uh, branching off the major avenues, and then alleys finally getting deep into the blocks where people live. There were networks of hundreds of wells which supplied water to the residents. A drainage system was in existence, and even the smallest houses were connected to it. Houses were made of fired clay bricks. They had several stories. More than 4,000 clay, stone and copper seals have been recovered in excavations. These were used to mark trade goods and for other purposes. Most of these seals combined text with images of animals, plants and persons. Even within the small space of the seal, animals are depicted in a highly naturalistic manner. The artist not only observed the world around him closely, he also had the means and skill to translate that observation into pictorial form. One of the most fascinating seals from Mohenjo-daro is that with a depiction of a man seated cross-legged on a seat. The posture is very similar to yoga, which is an essential aspect of the spiritual life of India till today. The figure is flanked by several animals, leading some to identify him as a prototype of the later Lord Shiva, who is also known as Pashupati, or the Lord of Beasts. Animal figures are made on the seat. Such seats, as well as the other elements of this depiction, are very similar to the images of Hindu and Buddhist deities in later Indian art. The artifacts that have been excavated from the Indus Valley culture are unique in their small scale. No monumental sculpture has been found. All the art objects, whether in terracotta, stone or metal, can be described as being on a human scale. This is surely also related to the fact that no palaces or other monumental architecture has been found. All excavated evidence points to a thriving cooperative system which was in existence and not a conventional kingship. One of the most enigmatic sculptures is a bust, sometimes known as a priest or a king. This is perhaps because of the dignified countenance 
and royal bearing of the figure. A male torso made of stone has been tentatively dated to the Indus Valley period. The breath of life, which is a characteristic feature of Indic art, is seen in this early depiction. The softly swelling stomach and the smooth modeling of the muscles again attest to the skill of the artist. One of the most delightful figurines is that of the dancing girl. Approximately 10 centimeters in height, this tiny figure stands with one hand at her hip. The body is composed of long tube-like limbs. She is made resting her weight on one leg in a very natural fashion, as in the contrapposto techniques of later sculpture. The jaunty manner and liveliness of the figure are remarkable. Around 1700 BC, with changes in the course of the rivers, many of the settlements in the river valleys had to be given up. In this period, people began to move down into Gujarat and also eastwards into the valleys of the river Ganga. By the beginning of the first millennium BC, a second phase of urbanization in the Indian subcontinent began, this time in the valleys of the Ganga. By the 8th or the 9th century BC, the Upanishads were composed out of philosophic traditions which perhaps came from the earliest times of Indian civilization. The thoughts contained in the Upanishads were to form the basis of all major Indic religions thereafter. In this period, there were large numbers of ascetics who gave up the material attractions of the world to seek the truth beyond. The names of two historical renunciators of this tradition became most prominent. One of them is Mahavira, who is known as the 24th Tirthankara, or Victor, and those who follow his path are known as Jainas. The other is Siddharth, who is known as the 4th or the 7th Buddha, or Enlightened One, and those who follow his path are known as Buddhists. Both Mahavira and the Buddha taught the philosophy of the Upanishadic age and there are striking similarities in their teachings. One of the main principalities in North India was Magadha. Under the leadership of the dynamic Chandragupta Maurya, it expanded and became the first empire on Indian soil. With the coming of the first extensive state, the art also changed. Instead of the small, personal-sized objects of the earlier period, art was now created to project the messages and grandeur of rulers. Chandragupta Maurya's grandson Ashoka further extended his empire to cover the whole of North and Northwestern India perhaps following the examples of the Achaemenid Persians, he inscribed his messages on rocks and large pillars which he erected. But that is where the similarity ends. In keeping with the continuing Indian traditions, his inscriptions display that he was preoccupied with dharma. Dharma is a man's duty to all others and the whole of existence around him. 
Ashoka's messages to his people were to follow the ethical path, to respect teachers, elders, and much else which is a part of dharma. The lion capital of the pillar at Sarnath is a fine example of royal Maurya art. Four lions placed back to back face the cardinal directions, indicating the spread of dharma. These are formal and stylized and are reminiscent of the Persian tradition. However, other examples like the bull capital from Ram Purva are carved in a naturalistic manner. The four lions on the Sarnath pillar originally supported a large chakra or wheel. Chakras are also made on the circular drum under the feet of the lions. The chakra is an important symbol of cosmic order in Upanishadic thought. In Buddhism, it represents the turning of the wheel of law. Unlike the lions above, these animals are made in a highly naturalistic manner. Ashoka and his grandson Dashratha made rock-cut caves at Barabar, near Gaya, in present-day Bihar. They were made for the Ajivikas, a deeply ascetic sect of that time. This began one of the greatest architectural traditions in India. A very large number of rock-cut caves were made later for Buddhists and Hindus. The Mauryan period brings us finely sculpted figures, which established the traditions to come in later times. A two feet high nude male figure may represent a follower of the Digambara sect of Jainas, who renounce clothing. The artist's mastery over stone is seen in the naturalism and sensitivity in modeling. There are many similarities between this figure and the tiny male torso of the Indus period. One of the best known sculptures is that of a female chori or whisk bearer that was found at Didar Ganj in present-day Patna. The high polish of the sandstone here is a hallmark of Mauryan stone sculpture. The story of art is the story of humankind, of man's perceptions and thoughts. From the river valley civilizations till the period of the imperial Mauryas, we see the foundations laid of the art of one of the oldest civilizations. We see a vision of the world and the roots of a culture which has survived more than 5,000 years. We see here the beginnings of a very unusual tradition of art, a tradition of art which is closely aligned to the philosophic path, a tradition of art whose purpose it is to always lift the veils of illusion and show us the grace which underlies it all. It is a tradition which does not try to follow the or depict the optical reality of the world. So it is not photographic reality. It is not realism of the Western academic kind. It is another kind of realism. It is a realism 
which goes to the heart of the matter. It is a realism which depicts the essence of life, the grace which is behind it all. And it elicits from us always a response to that grace. For the purpose of the art is to awaken the grace within us. And when that grace would fill us completely, then we have become the deity that is being presented in the art. So these are the beginnings. And in fact, in uh, subsequent films, we shall also see the development of that. I would be uh, happy to uh, answer uh, a few questions if there are, and I would request uh, I would request you to put them in the chat box and would request uh, Sujata to please uh, read them out from there. Thank you. Till the questions come, let me take this opportunity to tell you about our next screening, which is going to be on the 9th of December, same time, same year. The name of the film is Beyond the Illusory World. And this would be a film about early Buddhist and Jain Astupal. So please mark it in your calendar. We'd love for all of you to be with us. There's a comment from Ajay Potar saying that in the beginning there was Hamshra Thwani instrumental music which added to the visuals and narration. Thank you for noticing that. Yes, uh, in, uh, in all my films, we had uh, music which was uh, recorded for the films and it was it's always been a joyous exercise to uh, to use uh, or try to use appropriate music thank you ajay there's a comment from krishna Bhuli saying kalyu indeed indeed the materialistic world that we live in is something which uh, which confuses and confounds us every day. And we do need the beauty of art to help us to see what is beyond, to unravel the knots, to see the beauty of life. Thank you. Dr. D.K. Mazumdar, sir, please elaborate on the uniqueness of the Rampurva bull which is now preserved in the Rajapati Bhavan. Yes, I'm so glad that uh, you mentioned that. Yes, uh, the Rajapati Bhavan was very kind to allow me to uh, shoot uh, the Rampurva Bull capital, which is there. In fact, you might have noticed uh, this is all original shooting in the film. So you might have uh, noticed that it's uh, really a journey across the country so many different places, so many, many different places which you saw in the original shooting uh, or the film which you saw. Yes, uh, these, are the, these are the capitals which were on top of uh, the pillars of the third, third century BCE, known as the Ashokan pillars. And the, whereas the uh, Lion uh, capital that you see at Sarnath is made in a very stylized form. The Rampurva bull uh, is made in a very naturalistic way, much more in keeping with the uh, Indian tradition and the Indian tradition to follow. Very beautiful. Thank you. Krishna Bhuli, this is a comment by him saying, art is to feed beyond mundane sensories. Yes, Krishna, isn't it? It is marvelous to see how the Indian artist, uh, while using the senses, while using the senses with which we respond to his art, while using these senses, attempts to and succeeds in taking us beyond the world of the senses. In fact, that is the great challenge which Indian art faces all the time, everywhere, and so wonderfully successfully to use the material uh, in terms of stone and uh, paint to use the material and to use our response through our senses and yet 
always with the purpose of taking us beyond the material, beyond our senses, to that which is beyond, that which helps us to realize the truth that there is in the world, that which helps us to find the peace which there is within us. So this is one of the marvels of uh, Indian art, how the, the contradiction of uh, the use of uh, the sensory to take us beyond the senses. Thank you, Krishna. Gaurish Naran, how was the Ashok Chakra introduced? Who made the Ashok Chakra? The uh, Chakra, uh, being called the Ashok Chakra because we also find it on uh, the uh, capital of uh, uh, an Ashokan pillar. The Chakra is one of the uh, universal symbols of Indian thought. You find it in uh, all the ancient uh, art of uh, the Buddhists, the Jains, and the Hindus. It's a, it's, it's a symbol of cosmic order. And it's quite marvelous to see how uh, the same uh, symbols are used by the various faiths. Thank you. I think that's about it. Would you like to share with everybody about our YouTube channel? Well, uh, if you would like to see uh, more films uh, on these subjects, you could uh, go to the YouTube uh, channel after my name, Benoy Behel, and I hope that you may enjoy some more. And thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to share with you. And thank you very much, Sushant, for your excellent screening. And once again, to the Habitat Center for this uh, marvelous screening. Thank you so much.